Hello, Faith Baptist Church. Welcome to our Tuesday evening Bible study once again. Um, I have my COVID beard going on. It's only two weeks into growth, but um, I'm going to keep it nice and neat and trimmed. Uh, but just wanted to try it out, and my wife gave me permission. No, I, I, I appreciate her. She usually doesn't like me having a beard, but she allowed me to do it this time, and I'm going to try to grow it to see what it looks like. Never had one in the 48 years of my life, uh, so I'm going to see what it looks like groomed. I probably have more white than dark, but hey, we're going to try anyway. Um, so I hope that you're having a great week. I hope you listened to Pastor Dan's divine appointment message, wonderful message on Sunday. Uh, very thankful about the lad with the fishes. And uh, some, he pointed out some tremendous aspects uh, that are brought out in those verses and that story. And I'm thankful that Pastor Dan is putting these together. Also with our Sunday school and our children's church, all of that have been wonderful. So please continue to tune into those on Sunday. Hopefully soon uh, we'll be able to meet in church. And I know there's been some um, um, petitions put out to the president. We'll see if it happens here shortly. Uh, and we'll be ready for that. I'm excited, especially when it comes to doing lessons like this one on the duty of parents with our Love and Truth series. It's, it's fun for me to get input from you on what's happening in your homes as you feel open and free to talk about that. That's, it's a great back and forth lesson that we can learn from each other. But that's okay. I'm going to talk to you today uh, from what I've learned from God's Word. And He's really shown me some things in my own life uh, that I still need to work on in this area of being a parent. All right, let's get started. Uh, duty of parents. We're going to have a two-part series here, the duty of parents. And many of you have heard of Ephesians 6.1. My kids have learned that one backwards and, okay, maybe forwards, not so much backwards. Uh, but Ephesians 6.1 has been indelibly imprinted into their minds. Children, obey your parents and the Lord for this is right. We're not going to look at that verse today. We're going to go to verse 2 and look at verse 4 as well. But if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 6, and we're going to look at verse 2. It says, Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise. Now, if you wonder where that came from, you go back to Exodus chapter 20 and verse 12, and it talked about this idea. Actually, it's where this one came from. God commanded or gave the Ten Commandments to the children of Israel through Moses, writing on the tablets. And one of them was to honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which I have given to you or I have promised to you. Exodus 20 and verse 12. Now, when I looked up this word to honor in the Greek, is timao, timao. Now, timao, it carries um, a different really meaning than to esteem um, to show deference, uh, to respect. It has a word that's attached to it that I found fascinating. And you have to see this word if you go with me to Matthew, Matthew chapter 27 and verse 9. Matthew chapter 27 and verse 9. Are you there? I hope you have your Bibles. Matthew 27 and verse 9. It says, Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him that was valued, whom they of the children of Israel did value. Now that word there, value, is the same word in the Greek that says honor in this passage, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 2. To value something. Now here, the value was on the thirty pieces of silver. Actually, it was on Jesus. The value was of Jesus. Jesus being the ultimate value being the price that was paid, the preeminent one. We cannot necessarily compare. We can't compare a parent to Jesus as far as value is concerned. But we see the root, the root word, the word value. So if we implant that into this passage, Ephesians 6 and verse 2, we see to obey and to value. And whether you're a child, whether you're a teenager, or whether you're 48, we need to continue to value our parents, to honor them. There's a time early on when we understand the word to obey and obedience. We're going to talk today to understand how to help you honor your parents. These are the next two lessons. We're going to examine this idea of honoring parents and the duties that God gives mothers and fathers. We have tremendous responsibility. That weight has been on my shoulders 
for the last 15, now close to 16 years with my children. And I want to be able to, to do what God directs me to do from his word, the principles that are shown, so that I can teach them how to obey and to value, to honor the parents. Now, please mis- don't misunderstand me. I don't want to leave out the others who are raising children that are not maybe the mother or the father, because we have a lot of uh, grandma, grandpa. Uh, we have aunts, uncles that have raised children. You are in those roles of the mother and the father. And this, is, if you're listening, this can apply to you as well. This does apply to you on how we teach our children, those who are under us, who have been given the care uh, to us, that we need to teach them to honor and to obey, to honor and to obey those that are over them. Now, as we see the nature of godly parenting, the nature of godly parental love, we're going to look at that today in two different areas. We're going to see the nature first, and then we're going to see the form of godly parental love. We're going to see the nature, and then we're going to see the form. Now, if I can give you some biblical descriptions of godly parenthood, you're going to recognize these. And some of you, it's going to be second nature to you because you've been practicing these. I hope you have been. Maybe if you've stumbled in some of these areas of practicing this godly, the nature of the godly parental love, this will apply to you and the Holy Spirit will speak to your heart. I hope you're ready to listen. So biblical descriptions of godly parenthood do include love. We know that. But here are some descriptions. A parent who feeds or who who will feed and care for their family. That's the nature of godly parental love. Someone who will take care and provide for the needs of their family. This has become tough for many during this time because of a loss of a job. But still, if you have the love of God in your heart, if the love of God is reflecting, as we've talked about before, in your heart, and other people see it, you will realize that it is my job to take care of the needs of my family. I'll do whatever I can outside of breaking God's law so that I, to take care of the needs, to take care of my children, to take care of my wife. God promises to meet your need. That is a promise that we should not take lightly. I know it's become almost a cliche. And you might say, well, Tony, it's easy for you. Pastor Tony, it's easy for you to say. No, it's not. Because I know there are times I think of the future of what my kids are going to be a part of in getting married, in going to college, in uh, just needs they're going to have even from now until the time they graduate from, from secondary school. I'm not going to have the money for that. Now, I praise the Lord that he has provided the needs for food and clothing and even shelter, which is not included in those, in, in the promise that he gave. It's extra and above, and we've seen that Many of you have seen that in your own lives. But let's look at something else. Parents who discipline and instruct their children. That is the nature of godly parental love. First of all, you will feed and care. Second, you will discipline. As we see, God disciplines us. Now, our kids, when we tell them we love them as we discipline them, they're thinking about the radiation that's coming off of their backside from the discipline aspect. <laughs> and uh, they, they're, they're not understanding sometimes. They, they do as they get older, the idea of love as we show that to them. But we also see another nature of, of godly love and godly parental love is parents who reflect God's care to the children. We care for them because God cared for us. We are a reflection of who God is. All parents should connect to their children with God's goodness but what does this kind of love look like? We're going to look at some areas, this, what this kind of love looks like, the nature of godly parental love. First of all, we see it's representative. It's representative. Who do you represent? As a father, I realize in my study of Scripture that I represent God. Not that I am God, not that I have the characteristics of God and, and am perfect like God, but I represent God in the form of the Father. And we, have, we can represent in a bad example or a good example. As we think of the way we represent God, we look at our children and we understand the way we treat them will give them a depiction in their mind of who God is, an example of who God is to their lives. If we are harsh, if we are demeaning, if we, if we don't take care of them, we don't meet their needs, if, if we... Uh, if we treat them badly, if we, if we abuse, 
then a child, as they grow up and we continue talking or they hear about God in church, then they think, wow, this God, if, if he's like my father, he's harsh, he's mean, he's degrading. Now, a child can break away from that if that's taking place in the home. But I tell you, as a father, and I'm preaching to you as a father, as a mother, you need to realize that we represent who God is. And our child will grow up many times knowing God by looking and seeing how we treat them. Because it's not, and we know this, and I know this as a pastor, it's not about necessarily all that what we say, even though we do preach truth, it's how we live our lives that makes a tremendous impact. We need to practice what we preach. And I know many times as a father, I have to take a step back and say, wow, I have not been doing what is right. I have not been practicing what I have been preaching to my children, and I need to ask their forgiveness. I'm thankful that we have a God that is perfect, that never does wrong, that never fails us, that never forsakes us. But I need to be a father who lives a life pleasing to that description of who God is. Now you say, man, Pastor Tony, you're giving me something that's almost impossible. Well, it is impossible to be God. But it's not impossible to have, ask God to give us the strength we need to carry out what we should be doing as a father in our lives and to give our children a great depiction of God's love and what his love should look like to them. It's representative. It's helpful that God presents himself as a loving heavenly father. We've seen bad examples and, and we might have even been part of being a bad example, unfortunately. A good example is a great start. As we show God's love and as we treat children the way God treats us, treat our children the way God treats us, it gives them a good start in helping them to understand theology, the study of God, knowing who God is. Representative. So the question is, how do parents and guardians impact our idea of God? They impact it tremendously as children. I know my father, as I look at, and we've talked about some weaknesses, and we all have them as fathers. We've talked about some weaknesses, and he brought them up, and I've mentioned them to him as we've discussed as I've gotten older. Some things that I took from what he had, the way he acted in his life towards me, and that influenced my thoughts upon who God is. That description of our earthly father paints somewhat of a picture of who our heavenly father is. Now, again, that doesn't negate the truth of who God is. Don't misunderstand me. But we have an example that we need to portray, and it does create an influence in the lives of our children. We also see that it's unconditional. It's unconditional. The command to love comes with no conditions attached. We need to have our children see that in us. Our children are going to be hateful as they grow and, and, and understand their flesh and the world, and as sin takes a toll on them as they grow up and as they're learning, as it did on all of us growing up, they're going to be hateful. They're going to treat you with disrespect, father, mother. They're going to frustrate. But we need to show them that that does not change the way we love them. Now, it might bring about some discipline and some, and some stern talking too, but it doesn't change the love that we have for them. And praise the Lord, as we look at our Heavenly Father, it never changed the way He had His love for us. Jesus' death on the cross, Romans 5, 8, but God commended His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Unconditional love. He loved us enough. If parents want to reflect the love of God, they should show love to their children no matter what. Are you showing love to your children no matter what they've done and no matter what they're doing? That's a big question for all of us to answer. This one's rather weird, but it's asymmetrical. As we look at our parental, a godly example, nature of our godly parental love, it's asymmetrical. What is asymmetrical? Asymmetrical means not symmetrical. I know that sounds brilliant. Thank you. You say, thank you, Pastor Tony, for breaking that down for me. Um, no, asymmetrical, if you look at a, a triangle, and a, a symmetrical triangle would mean all the sides are equal. You have an asymmetrical triangle, it means it's not equal. <laughs> You're going to have some size longer than the, some size, that wouldn't be a triangle, would it? Um, or an asymmetrical, um, um, I don't know what you'd call it, 
Sorry, I'm my, my math is not my forte. <laughs> uh, an, an asymmetrical, maybe a polygon or uh, some other uh, drawing or way you, uh, anyway, we'll go on. Skip that part. <laughs> but what it means, basically, we'll skip the math part, not what I'm going to tell you now. Um, asymmetrical, as we look at our godly look at our parental love, our godly parental love and the nature of it, it can take different shapes, different outlooks. Let me put it that way. You look at a child in the way uh, that a child looks, a baby looks at its mother and father. A baby's going to look at them, and what do they expect? They understand love by being fed. They understand love by being having their diaper changed or taken care of. They feel comfortable. They don't truly understand the whole aspect of love. Now, as a child grows and becomes eight, nine years old, they begin to understand it a little more, even though their ability to reason things out is not quite there yet by the time they get to be a teenager. Again, they're growing in their understanding of love. And the way we show love as God shows love to us. You know, we couldn't understand our parents when you were a baby. You couldn't provide them with emotional support. You couldn't even feed or change yourself at first. That's something we couldn't do. And we learned how to show love in different ways as we got older because we understood who we were and who God wanted us to be. So we see that these loves are asymmetrical. Parents should not depend on their children for consistent love and emotional support. And as we see that, I know that's kind of a backward concept, because we should be able to focus on God and not look to our children. But there are a lot of parents who are wrapped up in all they think about and their focus is completely on their children instead of on God. As they get older, parents, they begin to depend and rely solely on their children, even as their children are in the workforce, have their own families. And emotionally, they are wrapped up completely in their children, getting involved too much in their lives. We shouldn't do that. That's not the love that God has portrayed through us to our children. We're training them. We're preparing them, which we're going to talk about here in a little bit, about getting out on their own. We also see that it's wise. It's wise. In Titus 2, we read that Paul encouraged older women in Titus's church to teach the younger women how to love their children. Now, a godly parental love is based upon a godly book, the words that God has given to us, His Word. And as we look at His words, we see how they impact the way we live. It's wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We look and understand God and who He is. We realize it's wisdom we are gaining. Are we being wise? Now let's look at the form of godly parental love. The form of godly parental love. There are three areas that show in its form. First of all, we see provision. Even imperfect parents want to give good things to their children. Now, as we look at it, we are imperfect parents. <laughs> we don't do everything right. And, and I can't make this statement as a whole because I've seen parents who get hooked on drugs that spend all their money on drugs to please themselves to get their fix and they don't take care of their children at all in fact their children will be starving and the police will have to come and take those children out of the home because they're not being taken care of being sick and not getting medicine not taken to the doctor some being close to death I've seen that it's hard for me to fathom a parent being that selfish but that's sin as it ravages the body so we as a parent natural in our natural state, in our flesh, before salvation, even after salvation, when the flesh is what is in, in control of our will, mind, and emotions, we will not essentially have that natural love. We'll call it godly love in parenting. But we do want to give good things to our children. How much more does God want to give good things to His children? He has a perfect love. He is the perfect parent. As we look at a parent-child relationship, now, we have to be careful about not giving in to the whims of our children and providing everything that they want. No, we need to teach them, and we're, and we're teaching our children the area of money, helping them to understand the importance of money, the importance of, of, of not loving money, but understanding how money works in their lives, and the importance of saving, the importance of providing uh, for the needs of their families, 
and, and meeting their college needs if need be. Um, all of these, starting to plan in that direction. We want our children to be matured, and that's going to come in the third uh, third form we're going to look at. But provision is important for us as godly parents. Secondly, protection. Godly parents keep their children from corruption and serious danger. Parent, if you don't know who your child is with, I say from, you know, I know as babies we watch them, but even then I've noticed parents who leave their children, little little two, three-year-olds that are just starting to walk or have started to walk, getting close to the main road, not even watching. We've heard tragic stories of trucks just barreling down, running over little children who have not been cared for or protected or watched over. Same thing goes as they're 8, 9, 10 years old, even as teenagers. Do you know who your child is with? We can't just let that go and, and expect them to make all wise decisions on who they're with. We need to help them. We can't control every moment of their life. But our job is a form of godly loving parenting is to protect them. Children don't understand that as a whole. Even teenagers sometimes don't understand that what that means as protection. But we should do it. Who our child, who our children are with, where our children are going, um, what our children are watching on television, what our children are listening to on the radio, uh, all of those things are very important that we are involved in and letting them understand, hey, this might not be the best thing for you to watch because God says this. This might not be the best thing for you to say because God says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying. I will let no corrupt, I will let nothing corrupt be put in front of my eyes. It all affects us. We protect. The question that we ask ourselves, how much protection is too much? Are we sheltering our kids too much from being involved in things that will help them to grow? Mm. For me as a parent, and I have an older teenage girl now. My oldest is going to be 16 soon. And it really scares me to think of, of not being there for her in certain instances to be able to protect her. But that's part, as we look to God, if we can't be there, God's there. And we teach our children how to protect themselves, how not to put themselves in certain situations that could bring about danger in their lives. But we also have to give them some space. As they make their own decisions when they get to college, we can't go to college and be in the dorm room with them to watch out. I can't have Christy go be with Eliana when she goes to school and be in that dorm room every moment with every decision she makes. No, there comes a time that we have to realize, hey, I've prepared them. And that's the third form is preparation. I've prepared them to do what God wants them to do. Now, they're going to continue growing and they're going to make their own decisions. Godly parents help their children grow into godly mature adults. And that's what I want for each one of my children, that when they leave my home from under my authority, that they are ready to make wise decisions based on how I prepared them in God's word, how I taught them, how I emulated God as a father to them. They see the love of God through their father and through their mother. They carry that on into their family. That's what I want. And I hope that's what you want as a parent. You say, well, I've made some big mistakes and my children are already out of the house. Well, you can still get a hold of them and you can talk to them. It might be too late to do a lot of preparation in their heart, but you can let them know you're going to love them and unconditionally love them. No matter what they do, no matter what has happened, no matter what they've done, and you know, let them know that God loves them and wants them to choose right and do right. Nurture gratitude for the good that your parents or guardians provide for you. Nurture gratitude, being thankful, having that thankful spirit. I tell you, that's in today's society with youth, that is something that is very difficult. It was tough for me when I first came to Uganda, and as we were helping other people out, not just within the church, even without the church, hardly ever did we hear thank you. That was something that I had been taught from, my, from very young, is to always be thankful for what people do for you and to show that gratitude. Are we thankful to God for how much he's blessed us, or are we always complaining? Are we thankful to our parents for how they, tr they trained us and raised us? Now, again, you might not have had a parent that has done that for you, and I'm sorry for that. But you have a Heavenly Father who loves you and is, is, is nurturing you and loving you if you are his child, and we can thank him for that. 
Let God continue to work in your life as a parent and, and make sure, make sure if God has given you parents that love you, make sure you take them aside, call them on the phone, say, mom and dad, thank you. Dad, thank you. Mom, thank you for how much love and effort you put into me. I know you weren't always perfect, but I know you cared for me. And I hope my children do that for me someday as I continue to, to serve them and humbly be the right example that I should be. Well, we're going to close in prayer today. Thank you for listening. And uh, we're going to just quickly talk about, I'm not going to do a separate one for prayer requests and praises. I'm going to do like I did last week and just give you the Unreached People group. And I'm also going to give you the Uganda tribe that we're praying for this week. Uh, the first Unreached People group is the Berber, the Nefusa of Libya. And we want to definitely pray for this people group. Population is 179,000, so compared to others, not very many in this group left. A very old group of people, like go back, you know, long, long time. And they were a lot in Libya before the Arabs came in and kind of took over and wiped many of them out. And now they, they reside in the northwestern part of Libya. Their form of Muslim is not uh, a Sunni. They're, they're kind of a branch off of that. They're called the Ibad, Ibadiah. It originated in the 7th century when disputes arose concerning how religious leaders should be chosen. The Ib, Ibad, Ibadis withdrew from mainstream Islam and relocated in several other countries. Um, it has, Ibadism has been received in several northwestern, northwestern African countries as a vehicle for opposing the Sunni or the Orthodox um, Islam. Less than 2% are Christ followers in this group, so we need to pray for more um, to, to be reached and to start churches. And as we normally pray when it comes to the unreached groups, that someone will be saved within this group. They will be trained in the Word of God and be raised to be pastors so they can be an example and they can be leaders amongst their people. One interesting aspect of, of this group is the houses they build. They're called troglodyte houses, and they build them in, in, in the caves or in the mountains, in mainly of limestone. They dig in, dig down, and they have their, their rooms underground. And they, they make one little hole up in the top for the smoke to go out for their fires and also for some light to come in uh, in the center of their main room. Uh, so interesting way that they still do that. But we need to pray for this group. The, the Uganda tribe we're praying for, the Amba, the Amba of Uganda. Now, they are in the Rinzori Mountains in the southwestern part of Uganda. They're not, again, it's not a, a large people group here in Uganda, not a large tribe. Uh, in fact, compared to the other tribes, they have a little less uh, who claim to be Christian than a lot of the other ones. Usually we see the higher percentages of, of 70, 80, 90 percent. This one is down in the 50s in the percentage range. And for evangelical, which I've described to you the difference before, for evangelical, we're looking at 11% that truly could know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. So there's a great need for this tribe to be reached with the gospel. A little harder to reach being in the mountains, but God wants all men to be saved. And so we need to be praying about others to go to that area, maybe even one of you, to go and witness and give the gospel to the people and have, have churches started or see churches started in that area. Well, I'm going to pray to close everything up. And let's remember the different categories. You're going to get the prayer list and these unreached people group. And, and you'll see all of this on your prayer sheets on WhatsApp. But we're going to close now. And I'm going to close in prayer. And let's ask the Lord to work in our hearts, especially as parents, to be the parent that we need to be to our children, to be the right example, to show forth God's love, to, to provide to protect, and to prepare. Father, we thank you for your love and your goodness, Lord. We love you for who you are. There are so many things, Father, that I need to, to do and, and to grow in in my own life in this area of parenting. And I thank you for how you have trained me. I thank you for the godly parents you've given me that have given me a good example of your love and your graciousness. I ask now that you'll help those parents we have in our church. Some are brand new. They get to start fresh, little baby, and begin preparing that child to understand true love. Help them to see the importance of honoring and obeying their parents. That tradition continues as they get saved and have their own families and children. And Lord, we just need to love you with all of our hearts and love each other and our neighbors as ourselves. And that carries down to our very children. 
be with those that are sick, be with those that are um, traveling, Lord. I know not many are traveling these days. We ask that you'll be with the government as they continue to make decisions, especially about the opening up of churches, that that'll happen soon. We can get that started. Help us to be aware of those around us who need you to be saved, that we'll take those opportunities. Help us as we continue to disciple and train others. Lord, I think of the unreached people group that we've mentioned, the Berber, the Nafusa of Libya, also the Amba of Uganda, the tribe, Lord, that you will send forth labors into the harvest, that souls will be saved amongst these two groups, and that, that the men will be raised up, or ra- will raise up and, and call you blessed and, and, and worship you and, and will be trained in your word and in college and, and understanding truth and then start churches for your honor and glory. Give us a good, good day. Give us a good week. Help us to continue looking unto you, the author and finisher of our faith. In your precious, holy, and wonderful name, amen. All right, have a wonderful week. Lord bless you. And uh, please tune in to Pastor Dan on Sundays. And as they continue to, uh, as we continue our new mission project regarding the church plant up uh, above Jinja, uh, near Mbale, I believe, and about giving towards that, of what God would have us give to help them buy some land for their church. Uh, Praise the Lord for how he's providing in our situation and looking forward to getting into a new church building on a new piece of land. Hopefully, maybe even within this year, we'll see what God does and how God works. Have a wonderful week. May the Lord bless you. Remember to serve God with all your heart and trust in him with all of your heart.